Yes, okay. There you go. Perfect. Okay. All Good right. Here. There we Hi, are. Hi, Jen. Hi, everyone. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so um, hi everyone. My name is Nicole. Um, I am the digital communications coordinator here at Wellbird Trust, and I'm super excited to um, have you all join us today for the basics of birding, gulls, and shorebirds. Uh, you'll have to excuse me. There is a car alarm going off outside my house, so um, if you can hear it, my apologies. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to first acknowledge um, that the Wild Bird Trust is on the unceded, the ancestral, and the traditional territories of the Tsleil-Waututh people uh, and the Squamish and the Musqueam and that um, uh, here at Wildbird Trust, we are dedicated to working towards reconciliation and redress. And so a huge, um, yeah, thank you for uh, the Slavich of people allowing us to be on their land. Um, all right, so Kevin, um, I am going to introduce you and I am super excited because I have been able to introduce Kevin um, several times. Um, but um, Kevin is an amazing um, uh, birder. Uh, he's actually one of the um, founding um, members of the Wild Bird Trust um, and was a huge part of helping set aside the land that is now Maplewood Flats. Um, he is a lifelong naturalist, ornithologist, ecologist, and he is the retired chief naturalist and manager at Lynn Canyon Ecology Center and the DNV Natural Parkland. So um, I know that I could probably go on and on. Kevin has. Oh, that's great. The amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I love it. Yes. <laughs> But thank you so much, Kevin, for joining us again. And I'm super excited. I always say I learned so much during these. And so I'm going to meet myself and I will let Kevin, you take the stage and everyone okay, enjoy. And definitely write your questions in the chat if you want to, okay? And um, then we'll answer them when Kevin's done, all right? Perfect. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nicole. That's marvelous to be back. And uh, this keeps me on my toes because it makes me relook at a bunch of stuff I thought I knew. And of course, uh, I always find something I didn't know. So that's neat. So today we're going to go over the gulls. I think we touched on them last time. I just thought I'd go over them again. And uh, this is a, a sort of a, it's a complex situation with gulls. So this first uh, present slide up here on your screens is a group of large gulls called the herring gull group. It's a super species and it they exist all the way around the North Pole. So if you look on the right hand side you'll see the number one is beside a gull top of the screen top of that uh, circle and that's the Glaucus wing gull that we have here in beautiful British Columbia. And if you look on the left hand side circle, you'll see the number one and a brown line outlining where the Glaucus wing gull lives. And it's quite interesting because it lives, of course, in the North Pacific. <clears throat> but as you follow that, that left hand map of the Northern Hemisphere around, you'll see that there are a number of other these other species and uh, it's everything from uh, Thayer's gulls, Iceland, Thayer's Iceland gull, herring gulls, lesser blackback gulls, uh, yellow-legged gulls and uh, so these are all they all their ranges overlap and where the ranges overlap they interbreed they hybridize and you get very interesting mutations. And it becomes very difficult to identify some of these mutations as to who their parents are. And we live in such an area because south of us, not shown on this map, going south from the Puget Sound, Seattle area and the Salish Sea uh, and the outer north coast of Washington, and south coast of Vancouver Island, we get hybrids between a western gull and Glaucus wing gull. 
The Western gull looks more like number six on the right there, the lesser blackback. It, it's, its range runs from northern Washington right down into Baja, California. And that Western gull has a dark black back in the south in California. As you come north, it, it becomes darker, it becomes lighter, some more dark gray. And then you get the hybrids with the glaucous wing gull, our local gull. And, you know, they, those hybrids can look like herring gulls or they can look like uh, Thayer's gull. So it's very difficult. So this super species is quite amazing. And these are all, it takes all of these gulls four years to get to the adult plumage that you see illustrated there. So the first one I'm going to look at is the herring gull. And as you can see, it, of course, is, this map shows it as a uh, breeding in northern Canada, but it, you can see there's a, there's a pink area coming right down into BC. And that comes actually a bit further south than is shown in that map. So in the interior of BC, you find herring gulls breeding in the summer. Big beak, you can see. And it's sort of a, an evil look to the face <laughs> and a dark black primaries. So this is a breeding herring gull. And they, of course, winter on the coast, not in large numbers, but large enough to, to make uh, identifying them from uh, a hybrid gulls not easy. This is an adult glaucous wing gull. And you can see the wing, the wing tips are not black. They are similar color to the back. So this is the glaucous wing gull, and you can see it's, it breeds green area from northern Washington right up the coast of BC, Alaska, and out along the chain of islands heading for Asia. The uh, glaucous wing gull hybrid with westerns are quite interesting. And they, here they are. So you can see how similar they are to herring gulls. And to be quite truthful, uh, I do not generally try to to distinguish uh, myself, I don't try to distinguish between a hybrid and a herring gull, unless the bird is very close and I can see the eye. Uh, sometimes the eye on herring gulls is a light color. And the interesting thing is the expression, the sort of general facial, ex facial expression, if you like, is not as vicious in the hybrids as the herring gull. Now here is the Western gull, and you can see on the map on the left, its basic its range is from northern, sort of half halfway up the Washington coast, and then the whole way south along the coast into the Baja, California. And it does have really nice dark black back and dark primaries. So this is quite a, an interesting bird. And if you go down south of the border, when the virus permits us to do that again. These birds can be found on the Washington, Oregon coast, California coast. And they are quite impressive. So again, the bird on the bottom left is from Southern California. The bird on top left is from Oregon and Washington. So you can see there's a, there's a lightning of the back there. The birds on the right are the immature birds. And it takes four years for these large gulls to get immature, to get adult plumage. And in those four years, they have very different juvenile plumage. First year looks like this, second year is somewhat different, third year is different again. And each species is different. And the, the, all I can say, I'm not going to go into that here, but I would suggest if you're really interested in that, check the field guides. Certainly Sibley gives a very good uh, Account and so does uh, so a set number of other field guides really give you a good guide to trying to identify juvenile or immature gulls, large gulls. Thayer's gull has now merged with the Iceland gull, and you can see it breeds in the very far north of Canada. It's a slightly smaller gull, not much, maybe half an inch. Uh, than the herring gull glaucous wing, but they hybridize and they winter on this coast in small numbers. 
And you can see the, the wing tips are not quite as much black. One on flight here on the lower and the left. And uh, they ha don't have that evil look to the face. A uh, slightly smaller beak. And, uh, but again, not easy to identify in winter. All of these large gulls have done exceptionally well out of us, and especially our garbage dumps. We uh, have thrown away our garbage for millions of years. But since the, um, I guess the Second, Second World War, since the 1930s and 40s, we have just produced masses of garbage. And unfortunately, of course, a lot of it is non-biodegradable, but it is mixed with food waste. And we throw away a lot of food waste. It's unbelievable. And it goes to these landfills, these garbage dumps. And the gulls move in to clean it up, to eat it. Uh, and you can see in this photograph uh, on the left, if you look at that photograph on the left, you can actually see a gull with a black back way back there. So that's one of the uh, other large gull species, probably a, a lesser black backed but it may be a Western. Most of these gulls, I think, are herring gulls. But in this part of the world, they're glaucous wing gulls. And they do very well. Garbage dumps also attract bald eagles in this part of the world. What to the uh, Burns Bog landfill garbage dump. You'll see a lot of bald eagles there. And you'll also see a lot of crows, ravens, red-tailed hawks. Because, of course, garbage dumps attract rats. And rats attract hawks and other predatory birds. So they actually do pull in a lot of different species of birds. Even small birds like juncos and finches get food out of the garbage dump. Now, a slightly different species, thank goodness, uh, the Californian gull nests in the prairies in the pink zone on the top left, eats all sorts of insects like uh, locust. Uh, Grasshoppers, big consumer of grasshoppers. Farmer's friend in the prairies. This bird eats grasshoppers like going out of style. Slightly smaller bird than the uh, glaucous wing gull. And the glaucous wing gull is the only gull that stays in the Pacific coast all year. These Californian gulls migrate through in spring and fall, and they a few stay for the winter. Top right is what they look like in the winter. The head has a little bit of streaking on it. And you can see the bottom left is the summer breeding bird. They actually spend quite a bit of time in the winter out on the ocean. So it has this lifestyle of this uh, medium sized gull is uh, interesting in that in the summer it's a land bird and in the winter it becomes more oceanic. The mew gull, a very smaller gull again, and with a beak that's pure yellow, no red dot. It breeds up in the northwestern part of uh, North America, Alaska, Yukon, and northern BC, and it winters here in large numbers. Maplewood can have a flock of 200, maybe more, at times in the winter, but they disappear to breed further north in the summer. And here they are. You can see the birds on the right are the juveniles. It takes three years for this gull to get adult plumage, and it's dark brown, then it goes to the top right, and then becomes adult. They're actually quite a pleasant little bird. They don't go to garbage dumps. And indeed, the Californian and ringbills don't seem to go to garbage dumps. It's the big gulls that go there. And here is the mew gull. You can see the Juvenile in the second year and the adult on the top right in flight. These birds eat a lot of insects, a lot of, they, they also nest in the prairies, so they're eating a lot of the insects in the prairies. And they winter along the coast. You see they go right down into Mexico for the winter. Ringbill gulls, and hence they have ring bills, which makes them easier to identify. They are, uh, a bird that winters around the, the coast here, and they nest in the prairies, like the Californian and the new eating insects. And in the winter, they head back to the coast and 
offshore, like the Californian gulls, a few miles offshore. No, none, very few seagulls actually go right out into the open Pacific. In fact, there's only one species, two species of kittiwake that do that. Now, this is our most, one of our most attractive gulls. This is a little Bonaparte skull named after a relative of the Emperor Bonaparte. I think he was a cousin. Anyway, uh, he was a big ornithologist, this chap, and here's his gull. And you can see top right is the breeding Bonaparte with the little chocolate, black chocolate brown head, red legs. The immature bird is behind. The map shows the red area where they nest, the yellow area where they migrate through, and the blue area where they winter. Bottom right is a flock of wintering Bonapartes. And on the left, we have a Bonapartes immature flight in flight, and an adult Bonapartes in non breeding winter plumage on the lower left. Very small gull. Uh, trying to think of the size. Slightly smaller than a crow. So not a big gull at all and really nice to watch. Not a garbage eating gull. Here they are, they, they nest. Uh, and they, now this one is different. This is a Sabine's gull. And Sabine's gulls nest in old nests of other birds in trees, top left in the far north. In the Tower or boreal forest area. In winter, lower left, and you can see the nice eye ring on the bird in both the adults, with nice brown, uh, black heads. And Sabines are really northern. You can see here they nest on the coast of Alaska and across northern Canada in the very far north in the islands. But they migrate through here, going north and south. So they're worth watching for. You see very distinctive wing patterns on the lower on the lower left. The two birds in flight on the left. And in fact, uh, some were seen this spring migrating up uh, Barard Inlet, flock of about twenty of them. This is an adult in full breeding plumage. Again, a small gull, slightly smaller than a crow. Very. Uh, Delicate uh, flight, so not like our big glaucous wing gulls. Uh, this is a very small gull, like the Bonapartes. Nice, beautiful gull to see. Spend a lot of time actually oceanic with kittiwakes way out in the open Pacific. So, quite a different. Uh, this is a flock of Sabine's gulls in breeding plumage. It was a flock like this that was seen, I believe, uh, February, March, March, uh, going up Barad Inlet. So here we come to the shorebirds. And this is actually from a European uh, field guide, but the reason I used it, it shows these five species of plover that are possible to be seen on the coast here. So on the left hand side are the breeding plumage birds and the one that we're going to look at first is the one on the extreme left. Uh, it's uh, got a very black front, gray, and it's actually called a gray plover or black bellied plover. Uh, gray plover, black bellied plover, the names are, one is the Brits call them grays, North Americans call them black bellied, same bird. And they winter here. And in the, at this time of year, they are entering uh, breeding plumage. So they look like the bird center left with a nice black front and this sort of a gray mottled gray back. The other species here are golden plovers. And we do see all of these. But um, to the right of the uh, Black bellied gray plover is a golden plover. That's the northern golden plover found in Europe and uh, much of North America. South, just south of it, or if you like, bottom, underneath it is the uh, Pacific golden plover on the right. And then the 
American golden plover center. Now they, you can see that the, the pattern in breeding plumage is slightly different of the black. And say you go to Hawaii in the fall, winter, and spring, you will see the Pacific golden plovers running around on the lawns of the hotels and motels in Hawaii. The, uh, so that's quite a migratory flight across that open Pacific. The American golden plover goes down to Central and South America for the winter. And the, Euro the European one uh, is more Eastern North America and Europe. On the right hand side, non-breeding plumage of these birds. And this is what gets tricky. The bottom of the page on the right are the black bellied plover in non-breeding plumage. And those are the commonest ones here on the coast. After that, you might get some American golden plovers, odd time, mainly a fall and spring or migration, and generally one or two, rarely more than that. On, the, uh, on that right-hand page, uh, in the center right, is a bird called a dotterel. And that's a very rare bird on the coast. This is it in non-breeding plumage. A few, I think one or two, one maybe, to turn up on the west coast each year. And that's saying from Alaska right down to California. So this is a uh, ID for black bellied gray plovers. And you can see the variation from non breeding in the front to breeding plumage. And at high tide, out on the delta, this is the sort of thing you might find in some of the fields, <coughs> the grass fields out there. You can see on the left the, the uh, range of this bird, very far north breeding in the red area, migrating on, in the yellow area, and they go the whole way. Oh, sorry, this is American golden plover we're looking at. And you can see this American golden plover, it breeds in the very far north, it comes down the coasts, and it goes the whole way to Southern South America, into Argentina and Paraguay for the winter. So that's the American golden plover, not the black belly, which is on the right. You can see the black bellied has this nice black area under the wing. And that's a very distinctive, that stays in the winter as well. And you can see the black bellied, it also nests in the far north, and, but it winters along the coasts, Pacific and Atlantic coasts of North America. And it winters, if you go down to California, there are very large numbers. Even Boundary Bay has quite sizable numbers. So here we are, a, a wintering black bellied plover and one taking off in flight on the right. You see the black armpits. This is a beautiful illustration of uh, black bellied plover plumage variations. And uh, oh, I, always, I forget this man's name. Really good artist, North American artist. And uh, see beautiful uh, male uh, in breeding plumage on the left, a winter plumage male, and then uh, behind it is a uh, breeding plumage female, and then on the far right is a bird going from non-breeding to breeding plumage, and a couple more wintering non-breeding plumage, black bellied plover. Gorgeous birds to see. One of the major problems for all shorebirds, and indeed any birds that utilize beaches, uh, it are off-leash dogs. And unfortunately, uh, for birds breeding on these beaches, this can be a disaster. Uh, for uh, birds that are trying to feed and build up their body reserves when on migration or in the winter, when they need that heat in the middle of the night, uh, this means they are using energy to fly away from uh, recreational dog runs. So it's uh, something to ask everybody to control their dogs on beaches, uh, letting them chase wild birds uh, is not good for the birds. It really does them a lot of harm. Uh, one of our commonest, well, was one of our commonest birds 
uh, of the clover family on the coast here is the killdeer. And this is a killdeer clover doing the broken wing trick to allure anybody and any animal away from its nest. On the lower left is the a nest of a killdeer clover, and you can see it's cryptically colored, it's cryptically colored so that it blends in with the stones and pebbles and gravel that it's nesting. The nest is in. The camouflage is a big part of keeping this nest safe. So the plover tries to lure anybody away from that nest with this broken wing trick. It works for coyotes and uh, foxes, etc. cetera. Uh, they will nest, killdeers will nest on gravel covered rooftops because they like gravel to put their nests in. Oh, they will nest on open uh, sort of grassy fields. This is a painting of a killdeer with two little chicks. As soon as the eggs hatch, the chicks are mobile and they generally leave the nest as soon as all of the little chicks are, are hatched. Leaving the killdeer, we move now to the semi-palmated plover. And this one is, again, a, uh, a bird that breeds in the northern part of Canada and the far Alaska, Yukon, and the territories uh, right across Quebec and into Labrador. This bird is a very small plover, probably uh, robin sized, and very, uh, it's a very beautiful little bird to watch. It runs around like clockwork on sandy and muddy beaches, eating very small insects. It has nested this far south, but generally uh, it doesn't nest in BC. I think it would nest in Charlotte's on beaches. They are uh, really seen in on migration. They should actually be passing. A lot of migration is happening right now, May. And uh, these birds should be passing along our shores at this time of year, especially if you're on the outer coast of Vancouver Island. But we get a few, one or two uh, at Maplewood nearly every year. Semi-palmated plovers. So this is a picture of a group of semi-palmated plovers. And in fact, there are at least 10 birds in this photograph. Uh, oh, I'm just, I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. <laughs> I always get a different number when I count this photograph. So I don't know if you can see the 12, uh, but uh, there are 12 semi-palmated plovers. And again, you know, if you have a dog running on a beach, these birds are feeding. Uh, they're cryptically camouflaged in here. And then the dog flushes them and they, they lose a lot of energy when they're flushed. But most people don't actually realize that. Uh, so I found that if I, try to explain it to dog owners. Most dog owners go, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Oh, oh well, I'll put my dog in a leash then. Yeah, okay. So generally, uh, most people are pretty nice about that. Uh, people don't really think that their dog is doing any damage until, you know, you, you've got to be very diplomatic about the how you point this out to people. Uh, moving on to the black turnstone. This bird winters along our coasts in rocky coastlines. And uh, you can see it's got quite a different shape, a little pointy beak. And it's got very distinctive wing patterns and tail pattern in the lower right. It actually nests way up on the northwest, the, no the west and northwest coast of Alaska, but it winters the whole way down the west coast in the Baja. Very nice, it's again robin sized. And uh, in the lower left, it's, there's a black turnstone with a sanderling, another type of sandpiper that we'll come to in a few minutes. So black turnstones are, unfortunately, they've gone down in numbers drastically in the last 20 years. We used to have a flock each winter of about 20 or 30 at Maplewood. Uh, we don't get them anymore. Uh, they're still around, uh, but unfortunately, they've really decreased in numbers. This is a, a flock of birds uh, in flight, obviously. And these are all dwellers on rocky shorelines. And the, the bird in the very lower right 
is a black turnstone. You can see the white wing bars and the white on the tail. The markings on the back, that is a black turnstone. Above it are three birds. On the right are surf birds. And they also live on rocky shorelines. You've seen white rump, uh, quite different, slightly larger, different wing pattern, different tail and rump pattern. And then over on the left side, we have another two surf birds and then a smaller bird with a little sharp, slightly decurved beak, which is a rock sandpiper. So the wing patterns are very important and the tail patterns when you're trying to identify birds like this in flight. Hmm. And here we have the rock sandpiper on the right hand side. Uh, it's in winter, non-breeding winter plumage with a surf bird behind it. So you can see there's quite a size difference there. Beaks are different. And the lower left is a flock of rock sandpipers. I have not tried to count these, but you can see how camouflaged they are against stones and rocks blending right in. So this is one of their strategies for survival. We don't get huge flocks of them around this coast, but you can see them out at uh, uh, Lighthouse Park and the other small parks out there look, looking out towards little islands. Uh, all of these uh, black turnstones, surf birds, and sometimes a rock sandpiper can be seen there. West Coast is actually the best place to see most of these. This is a breeding plumage rock sandpiper. And they breed away up in Alaska and northern Canada. There's a flock of Dunlin in non-breeding plumage. This huge flocks of these birds are found out in Boundary Bay. That's one of the reasons that Boundary Bay is so important for migratory birds is the wintering Dunlin flocks. And of course that Vancouver Fraser Port Authority uh, expansion of uh, Roberts Bank is uh, going to do a lot of damage to these birds. You can see where the Dunlin winter uh, uh, on the right. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm looking at Sanderling. I've got to keep correcting myself. This is Sanderling. We've moved on to Sanderling. And here with the rock sandpiper on the left, uh, a, a flock of Sanderling, very white, pearly white, uh, gray little birds with black uh, wing markings. Uh, Sanderling like sandy beaches. And indeed, there used to be quite a few winter around uh, English Bay. But I think those numbers have gone down, mainly probably because of dogs running along the beaches, uh, unfortunately. Surf birds on the left. And on the right, a wandering tattler. Wandering tattlers occur mainly on the outer coast of Vancouver Island. They like areas where the surf is just pounding in. They're usually found with surf birds, rock sandpipers, black turnstones, uh, and usually one or two only. They're about the size of a, a large, well, they're actually larger than a robin. No, pussycat, I don't want you walking across here. Thanks. My cat is watching this. Uh, wandering tattlers winter right down into the islands of the Southern Pacific and along the coast, the whole way to Chile. And they uh, are birds not easily seen, but they do turn up once, twice a year in the winter around Vancouver. The Iona Jetty is one place that they've turned up. Uh, there was one actually last winter at Maplewood. Somebody actually saw one there, so there you are. You can turn up. Interesting bird, wandering tattler. Check that out in the bird books. Spotted sandpipers are a bird that one certainly can see at Maplewood. They migrate through at this time of year and in the fall. We, we used to have and hopefully still have some breeding pairs at Maplewood. They teeter, they, they bob their heads and tails. And uh, they're well named Spotted, and they are a sandpiper. Um, they also winter here in very small numbers, maybe one bird winters around Maplewood. So, Spotted Sandpiper. And this is a snipe. 
and snipe are a shorebird or, or wading bird, which likes marshy, grassy areas. It doesn't like to be out in the open. It likes to be in this, in a cover in marshes. And quite often, if you're walking through a swampy marshy field out in the delta, you may flush a snipe or two. Nice long beak, like all the sandpipers, with probes in the mud. This gives you an idea on the left how flexible that beak, in fact, is. And uh, can bend to get uh, different food items out of the deep mud. On the right is a, a painting by a woman called Woodford Austin of a snipe drumming. And uh, in fact, it's the tail, it's the feathers around the tail that cause the drumming sound, which is the mating call of the snipe. I'm gonna hit uh, ravens. So we're going to crows now. Uh, the raven is the largest crow we have. And it is quite a uh, character, like all crows, very intelligent. Uh, on the right, you can see the raven lower down, and an ordinary crow is attacking that raven. So I think, uh, sorry, Kevin, to interrupt. Yeah. I think that's actually for next month. Okay. Well, do you want to do you want us to stop now? Yeah, that's that'd be that's. I think that's perfect. Okay. <laughs> so next month. We will be talking about crows. Nice. Yes, <laughs> I love others. it. And I will, I have the uh, link for that. So I will go send that in the chat right now yeah. um, because it is there. Um, just give me one second. I just need to turn my video off for two seconds. Um, but people, feel free to ask questions in the chat or unmute yourself. And um, I'll be right back to moderate. So see yeah. you in a sec. So uh, any any comments? Any comments about Anna's hummingbirds? Uh, did Anna's hummingbird stop the, uh, the pipeline with the help of a number of people? But I think that's Marlon <laughs> visiting Anna's nesting Anna's hummingbird. Stop yes. the pipeline. <laughs> oh, Vicky, I see Vicky's hand up. Vicky, if you want to, um, you can unmute just by the lower left. Yeah, here. sorry about that. <laughs> no, 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 uh, you're perfect. <laughs> quick question on um, on some of the, like the Dunlins. Yes. There seems to be a lot of them down in the Skagit. Oh, yes, um, that's right. But they now they're just here for the winter, correct? Yes, they, they winter with us. And then uh, at this time of year, they'll be moving north yeah. uh, to the tundra. So nor very northern part of Canada, Alaska. The Dunlin are uh, quite a cosmopolitan sandpiper. Uh, they're found in Europe, Eurasia, and North America, and huge flocks. But they, uh, they nest, of course, in the high Arctic. And they utilize the vast amount of insects that are in the so high Arctic summer. That's my, cool. my curiosity question on them is how far south do they go? Oh, I think the whole way down into the Baja. Ah, uh, okay. And, and, and in fact, you know, they may even go into South America along the coast. I'd have to check that out, but they certainly- Okay, that, that explains good. why I thought that that's what I was seeing down further in California and stuff. Oh, yes. But the thing about California is everybody wants to winter in California <laughs> <laughs> because it's good climate. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, and it's it, and lots of food. Great. I mean, you take that San Francisco Bay area, big marshes, lots of mud flats, and then you've got those big sandy beaches uh, the whole way down into the Baja. Uh, no, everybody, including great blue whales off the Baja. So it, it's a very rich area for uh, marine life and, of course, for the intertidal estuary and estuary type life. And well, the, uh, the thing I've been curious about is when we've gone down in December, not only do we find a lot of hummingbirds, which is really oh, yeah. fun, 
yeah. more than we had when we were living in Tucson in terms of the small parks have a lot of the flowers uh, that they really like. But at the yeah. same time, if you're in those small parks on the coast, you see a uh, inordinate a number of uh, shorebirds in the rocks on the rocks and coming up into the park and I mean the small shorebirds even um, you know it was kind of a surprise a very small pocket park and you see oyster catchers yeah yeah it, it, it's much I, I think this is one of the one of the problems we have in this part of coastal uh, BC is that to be quite truthful, it's so easy for all of these migratory birds to go, hey, if I just flip out to the, if I fly over to the outer coast of Washington, I can just go right south along the coast, feeding the whole way, and I can end up in San Francisco Bay, Gulf of California, Mexican coast, where there's so much more food and the climate is so much warmer, and it's a nice way to spend the winter. So why wouldn't I go there, you know? So it's a tremendous magnet, which pulls a lot of birds from here south. And um, Boundary Bay is one of our prime wintering areas for waterfowl, mainly duck species and uh, some shorebirds like the Dunlin, black-bellied plover. Uh, but uh, yes, it's... it's uh, it's so easy for most of these birds just to keep going south. Uh, oh, I, I totally get it, but it's still kind of disconcerting to see some of these shorebirds that we see up here um, running into the water yeah. with all the people. Yes, yes. <laughs> because and they it, have it, to it do just, that. Yeah. It, and it's, 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 um, it's, it's just the, the, the habitat is so good for them further south. Yeah. And I mean, if you go to the outer coast of Vancouver Island, Tofino, to the uh, mud flats behind Tofino and Euculot, uh, that is a very productive area on migration. Like at this time of year, huge flocks of uh, shorebirds moving up and down that coast and ducks. It's quite extraordinary. Yeah. But yeah, of course, we're not allowed to go anywhere at the moment, right? We've got to stay, what is it, within our yeah, in our bubbles, uh, but birds don't have to quarantine. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. I very much enjoyed it. Now yeah, I've got to go to an appointment, but no um, I'll try to catch next time. Thanks. Thanks so much, Vicky, for your question. We appreciate that. Yes. That's always right. great to have, uh, you know, participation. We appreciate it. And have a good it appointment. <laughs> um, okay, I think there's one from Brianne in the chat. And said, you had mentioned that the Pacific golden plover is often seen in Hawaii, but the birds I saw on the law, laws or yeah, in the laws in Kauai were completely white. Um, is that common or a different bird? That's a good question, actually. Ooh, lawns, yeah, lawns. That's interesting. <laughs> I, I was in Kauai and uh, the plovers I saw weren't white. They're very gray. Yes, they can be yeah. quite gray. Yeah. But uh, a bit like, I mean, I would call my hair white. I think it's gray. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's sort of. <laughs> I guess I mean, it's, really, yeah, look really at it. <laughs> white, white is quite a, uh, yeah, because I, I know the Pacific golden flowers are the ones that winter in Hawaii. And they run, I mean, they run around on the lawns, at the motels, hotels. Mm -hmm. Anyone's a large open lawn, they're, yeah, they're there. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, maybe it was, maybe it was two different birds, but it could have been, yeah, could, could have been the same one, yeah. Like, uh, men and women, also of course, the thing is in, in Hawaii, you've got that bright sunshine, yeah, and it's amazingly different when you have really bright sunshine, it can, uh, it can make things look the colors somewhat different, you know, what, what is maybe gray. <laughs> bird turns quite white in the full sun yeah yeah it's true it's it's yeah. very true there's many like it. and i remember seeing a uh, a hawk called a cooper's hawk adult in california many years ago in full sunlight in southern california i thought i'd seen some sort of tropical <sighs> bird i couldn't believe how colorful it was 
I just had never seen it in such bright sunlight before. Whoa. But it was just amazingly colorful compared to what it would look like up here. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Dan <laughs> said, yes, this was in Kauai. Looked identical in terms of shape otherwise. And then thank mm -hmm. you. So yeah, exactly. Like I think um, also people see colors differently too. So like sometimes women can see a more variety of colors. So that could also yeah. explain it as well. Um, but and the light, yeah. it's amazing the difference light makes. So really strong sunlight. So true. Gray, a gray day, you know, just yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what I learned, which was really cool, it's not super related to gulls, but <laughs> um, I never knew that a bird's feather is actually the reason it might like look blue. The, the feather itself isn't blue, it's the way that the feather is shaped and right. the way it yeah. reflects, reflects or refracts uh, light. And yeah. so that's what makes it look blue. And I never knew that. I just thought it was a blue yeah. feather. Uh, yeah, that's right. It's the way, it's the way that the light hits the, uh, the pigments in the feather. Yeah, yeah. That, is so, yeah. that is so awesome. I really, just, yeah. I really love that. <laughs> and something one doesn't really, you don't really sort of think about that, you know, it's like, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well, we have about time for maybe one or two more questions. Yep. So if anyone in the chat has any questions, I know, Kevin, you're very comprehensive. I love listening because I'm always like, oh, I learned so much. But if you do have any questions, definitely let us know. Um, and just while everyone's maybe thinking of something to ask, uh, the next one is Crows and Ravens. And, um, and it will be, I think, June 5th. It's always the first Saturday of every month. So um, I put the link in the uh, chat so if you want to go and, and sign up and if not it's always on our eventbrite so um you can oh. definitely do that oh uh, leanne said someone on facebook asking about common white seagull in vancouver small white gull so i guess uh do you know of any small white gulls or common white seagulls here in vancouver well the, the, the commonest small gull there are two possibilities <clears throat> the smallest one is the bonaparte's gull but at this time of year it should be having a black head uh, mm. the other small off-white white gull would be the mu gull and it's it's pretty small and it's very common yeah but of course there are rare gulls and again i refer you to bird books the ivory gulls but who you see an ivory gull you'd have people queuing up to see it so yeah i think probably mu gull is what she's thinking of yeah but on these crows this covers jays, magpies, nice. and a bunch of other crow members of the crow family. Yeah, crovids, crovids. Yeah, crow, nice. yeah and, and uh, yeah, stories about ravens. Uh, ravens huh. are not only in local mythology of the native, the native people here of the nations, mm -hmm. but also the Vikings, uh, the Irish, the Romans, the Chinese, everybody has stories about ravens. Yeah. Because ravens follow, they see a marching army. And this goes back thousands of years, BC, Whoa. like four or five thousand years ago. They'd see a marching army and the raven would go, ah, those human <laughs> beings are going to kill each other. And there's going to be lots of dead human beings lying oh, around. Food. <laughs> and I'll get well fed. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so ravens are not stupid. They no, and they're they, not. And they still reckon we're a free meal ticket. Very in cool. more ways than one. Oh my goodness. So, some nice stories about the raven coming up. I love that. There's so yeah. many amazing stories about Raven. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like every nation in BC has like, some of them are very similar, but some of them are very different. But there's always but a story about Raven. you think of any, yeah, you could share I'll them with us next time. Yeah, I will. No, that sounds really cool. My my brother's friend, my brother and his friend are really into birding. They go hiking in the backcountry a lot. And um, they, they love doing Raven calls because, oh, yeah. and his friend can do like, I swear, like, he's going to do like five or six, which is pretty yeah. impressive because, you know, ravens have so many different calls, but. Um, um, they talk to each other. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. they got a language. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love the, <laughs> the water drop sound. Like, I, I can't do it, but. No. It sounds like a water dropping. It's like, Broop! and you're like, yeah. what was that? <laughs> yeah, and it's not, it, yeah, the noises they make aren't all calls. They're, they're very variable, yes. 
Exactly. Yeah. No, I it's think really people cool. have actually taught ravens to speak. Oh, you know, interesting. Say words. Yeah. I don't doubt it. I honestly yeah. don't doubt it. Like yeah. ravens are so smart. They are just so witty. Um, that's so cool. I, I do have one last question before we end about eagles. And this is something I don't know if you touched on in your presentation, but um, why is it so rare to see baby seagulls? Because they nest up up oh. in the north? Or... Well, yeah, most of most of the birds we get in winter nest far, much further north. Got it. Or in the interior in the marshes. Got but it. Um, our local bird, the Glaucus winged gull, mm -hmm. it quite often nests on the top of buildings in oh. downtown Vancouver. Uh -huh. But it's always on a flat roof or a, a ledge of a building. Yeah. And of course, they do, they do that to keep, yeah, to keep the, uh, to protect their young and they don't want us interfering with them. That makes um, sense. But, yeah, Glaucus wing gulls are the local one, the big one. And it, oh. uh, yeah, they nest, they can nest uh, flat roofs of buildings or, uh, window ledges or you know some of the buildings have uh, ornate ledges and things yeah very cool that's awesome but they, uh, the actual native for well, the glaucus wing gull they, they naturally nest on remote uh, rocky islets islands mm. so in the gulf there are a lot of small little rocky islands with glaucus wing gull colonies on them wow and uh, so they're, they're out there, but yeah, people don't generally go to those. They're hard. I mean, it's dangerous taking a boat in close to those rocky islands. Totally, totally. Yeah. In the water, there's always like shallow sometimes too. Well, that's so you right. You wanna... hit a rock, you know, under exactly. rock and you're in trouble. Exactly. Oh, that's, thank you for that. <laughs> I was always like, because sometimes you see like um, adolescent ones, like ones that are like in their teens kind of, you know, that's like right. I always yeah. consider it. You'll see them chasing like in August. You'll find the uh, young of the year chasing after mummy or daddy, trying yeah. to get fed still, and they're, they're, they're calling all the time. Yeah. Nice. But by that time, uh, they can fly. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, thank you so much, Kevin. I always... Well, thank you. Nicole. I love these. They're always so awesome, and I feel like I've just expanded my bird knowledge um, by so much, so I really appreciate it. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, and thank you to everyone who came and, and listened, and we hope you enjoyed. And um, yes, Brianne, woo -hoo. We'll <laughs> And thank you. you so much, Kevin. Yep, we'll see you next time. I'll see you next time. Have a great yeah. weekend, Bye. okay? Bye, everyone. Thank Stay you. Stay safe. Bye.